The McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, today, the topic, expectations. We were talking to a friend of yours the other day about the book Great Expectations and some of the insights that Dickens had in that book. But as we talked... Last night, we were starting to look at expectations in the marketplace. We were looking at expectations of things as random as farm-fed fish instead of, you know, salmon swimming upstream. Tell me about expectations. Well, Kevin, we'll talk about a couple things today. General market observations, for one. Some observations in the gold market. And, again, as random as it may seem, an interesting new movie out, Salmon Fishing in Yemen. (laughs) We would argue that there is sort of a Dickensian twist in it. So we'll tie that together as we go on. So are you headed to the desert to go fishing anytime soon? or uh, Not anytime soon, but it was an interesting story. Okay. You know, with the market, Kevin, we have global markets seeking an impetus to move higher and that, frankly, not finding one. Right. Here in the U.S., we've got the first quarter earnings from a variety of U.S. companies, and although they're beating expectations, they are falling short of being inspiring. Well, see, and that's the word that we're bringing into this program today, expectations, all right? I run a 13-minute mile, David. I mean, that's not impressive. Did you say run? (laughs) (laughs) I've got a dog that's 11 years old that is a little overweight, so we run very, very slow. But if I run a 12-minute mile, that's still hardly anything to write home about. But it's beating expectations. I mean, it's better than a 13. So these expectations that are being put out for these companies, David, are actually relatively low, and they're not signaling recovery. But if you can beat it by a penny or two, by golly, it makes for good TV. Well, and actually, speaking of TV, this last week on CNBC, one of the questions was relating to Freeport McMurray, and we discussed it in depth with Brian and Kelly. And the issue was, you know, they beat expectations by 11 cents. They were right. supposed to earn 85 cents. They earned 96 cents. Wasn't this great news? And the problem was really if you looked at last year's performance versus this year's performance, they earned $764 million this year, which is great. But last year they earned $1.5 billion. Now, this is three years of a declining trend, and although the Grassberg mine was closed for three weeks, you, right. you have to look at it in a larger context and say, wait a minute, three years, yes, that may be a trend does make, as opposed to three weeks or three months or what have you. And so, yes, the number beat expectations by $0.11, cents, but they have some some significant issues. Dave, I saw the interview. Okay, and it is. It's like popping their bubble. There's a difference between you and I getting to talk about what we think is the reality of the market without feeling like we have to keep people upbeat and the heartbeat high and all the excitement of financial TV. But when you fly out to New York, they have certain expectations as well. And the expectation is that you're going to say, hey, they beat expectations by a couple of pennies. That's good news. And it wasn't. And I saw their faces. They were trying to turn it around from that point forward. No, in, in fact, I I don't know if I should even say this, but I did get a series of emails saying that I was not allowed to talk about the initial jobless claims. And then it was followed up with another email of, do not discuss initial jobless claims. Don't don't discourage the audience. (laughs) You shall not. It was almost like a royal, thus spaketh the media. It was interesting. No, it was a good interview. But the issue, Kevin, you've got jitters in Europe that are not surprising Yes, they're back, but what is surprising is that we thought it would be perhaps a little bit further out on the time horizon, that the long-term refinance operation, which we've talked about, started in December, and then a second follow-up in February, that was designed to relieve credit stress at least until the fall of 2012 at the earliest, and 2015 for a good number of loans, uh, so even buying even more time. Well, and all of the Federal Reserve here in America, the ECB is already suggesting alternatives to monetize rather than refinance. Well, right. The LTI. TRO is not sufficient. They're finding that they actually have to monetize. So the ECB is back to that gambit, and the Fed is as well. Two weeks ago, more than $10 billion. Last week, more than $23 billion in treasuries that were monetized. And again, Kevin, we're seeing some root rot in the credit markets, and it's just faster than we would have assumed, given the amounts of money that have been made available to the credit markets to sort of stem the tide of concern. Well, and actually looking further down the horizon is the IMF. I mean, they're already raising funds for the next crisis. Well, right, Kevin, but even though this looks like sort of the battle royale and the remake, 
overseas in the European credit markets, we will have our own version of that here in the next 12 to 24 months in the U.S. The U.S. is having to defend the Treasury market and having to suppress interest rates to gain an advantage in the credit market. You can't carry $15 trillion in debt. Now the estimates are by Labor Day to have over $16.6 trillion in debt. You can't carry that kind of debt load without being concerned about the interest component, and you've got to keep it low in order to keep it affordable. So there's a lot at stake, and over the next 12 to 24 months, so we're going to get to see just how willing and what tools they're willing to use to defend this position. Well, and, you know, the IMF is actually recognizing this at this point. I mean, they're starting to raise funds for a crisis that they say may be coming down the, the road. The next global credit crisis, which they assume is sooner rather than later. Right. And, yeah, this is likely because they recognize the European bank capitalization requirements are in the process of having to be met. There's the need to get capitalization ratios to higher levels. In other words, there's a need to have more more liquid capital available at each bank. And what that really entails, Kevin, is that they have to sell off assets. This is remarkable. If you remember, these are very, very highly leveraged balance sheets, these mm. individual financial institutions. And they own a bunch of stuff but have m borrowed money to buy it. You generally think of what you have in your own personal portfolio, and you think, well, I own it. Well, but if you use margin to buy a little bit more than you could afford, right. now you're sort of increasing your risk component, and you could end up with a margin call if something happens. Well, they've blown out the concept of a margin call, and once they achieve these new capitalization ratios, Kevin, of 7%, that will bring them down to a quote-unquote conservative portfolio of 14 times leverage. 14 times leverage. So basically what you're saying is it's like a $140,000 investment with $10,000 down. You know, that's not exactly a conservative way to run a bank, but right. that is the European version of getting more conservative. Now, we've got better capitalization rates in the United States at our big banks, but we've been seeing them take and move a lot of their loan loss reserves, move them into earnings. That, in fact, we were talking about freeport McMoran earlier. Morgan Stanley and Bank of America both did that. You had multi-billion dollar moves from loan loss reserves over to earnings, and they beat their numbers. But was it from organic growth? Was it from expanding their loan portfolios? Well, Chinese growth is slowing. That's another component sort of in this general market segment. Yes, it's growing, and you know the argument is, well, 8.1% is a heck of a lot better than U.S. growth. What are you complaining about? Right. It's the trend that you see, and it's really a trend towards reconstructing their entire economy, which requires, partially by design, partially not, a slowing of growth as they reorient, as they retool towards a different kind of growth. And that, again, is in complement with Europe and the U.S. tightening their consumptive habits. If it wasn't by choice and by design, they would have to make these changes because it's not like they can't can be the exporting giant they were, feeding an limitless appetite in Europe and the U.S. Well, and David, I think we should probably point out, shifting gears here, that looking at the markets over the last six months or so, in one way seems, you brought up the word grind the other day, it seems like just sort of a grind. You know, Europe's not quite a crisis completely falling apart. China's still growing, but it's shrinking in its growth. Earnings expectations are above normal, but they're still in recession or depressionary kinds of moves. Gold, I'll give you an example of gold. Okay, we sent our clients a few months ago a picture of the 65-week moving average of gold, which for the last 10 or 11 years has just been steadily rising. It's a nice incline. If you look at the average price averaged over the last 65 weeks, it's continued to rise. But here's the crazy thing. If you watch daytime financial TV and are completely fixated on the price, what you're going to see is that gold went from $1,900 over the last six months down to 16 mids, okay? Yet the moving average moved from $1,300 to $1,600. So the long-term market is coming up and meeting it. The expectation is that that will continue. The problem is short-term thinkers right now are just looking at the last quarter. And what you may not realize is that you are subject to influence. And whatever your information source is, you're either going to be thinking in terms of long-term or short-term. Right. You know, so if you do have a nanosecond judgment, be aware that it may be sort of contemporary media that has shrunk your sense of time and really forced an important decision into an irrelevant sense of time. You need to be looking at the longer-term issues, right. and that's where I think you see the major trends playing out. A few weeks ago, I was at a meeting in New York, Kevin, and Stanley Druckenmiller spoke, one of the greatest traders of our generation. And one of the first things he said, well, is, 
that bear market inequities that began in 2000 and has yet to end. Mm-hmm. That's how he began his comments. Yes, we're in a bear market inequities, and yet you wouldn't hear that. The context is so truncated. We think of these little miniature cycles, whether it's this week, this month, this quarter, and not in terms of the major trends in the market. We have had a breakdown in the credit markets, and there has been no fuel to take equities to new and higher levels. We've been through this almost 12-year process of a sideways grind, very much like that period, 1966 to 1982. We went nowhere quickly during that same period of time. Meanwhile, as you got towards the end of that cycle, inflation began to pick up. We will see that, I think, in this cycle, too. And that was not only the concern of Druckenmiller, but a lot of folks who were at this conference. But it was interesting, because here's a trader who does think in short-term snippets, but he's willing to acknowledge that we have a larger context here, and that larger context is bear inequities. Well, what was one of the things he was bullish on? Incidentally, gold. But that's maybe for the next part of the conversation. Well, and on that 1966 to 1982 period, I think we need to point out that gold rose 30-fold versus equities at that time. That was an amazing reversal, but very few people actually recognized it. Oh, and it was incredibly volatile, but what we would point out is that the trend was not volatile. Right. The trend was generally up. It was intact. It was intact. It yeah. moved up over a 10, 12, 15-year period. It didn't get to where it finally went in a day. And so if there is a destination out there, we need to realize that there is a bit of a journey in that process of getting to the destination. And I think what you see as sort of a reminder of signposts that you are on the right track is that 65-week moving average. As you mentioned, it's gone from 1,300 up to about 1,615, which is amazing. The right. trend is slow moving, but powerful. And it's often the daily movements in the market that obscure the long-term trend. If you're following a major consolidation, which we are in a major consolidation, which is to say a move sideways or a move down in price, the next move is higher. And it doesn't have to be gold, but if you're looking at these periods of consolidation in any investment, that's generally the next direction. The price has moved down now to the 65-week moving average. It's done this repeatedly over the last 10 years where support was strong there at the 65-week moving average. And that average. was typically the lowest you could buy that before it moved on up to a new level. Now, there was an exception to that. It was in 2008 yeah. where you had a very short-lived decline and full recovery to even higher prices, and that full recovery and decline took less than 90 days. So your worst-case scenario, your catastrophic event in the deleveraging of the world as we knew it meant that gold took a sidestep for a three-month period and was right back on track. Whoa. Talk about, whoa, all right, David, in the 1990s, there was another trend that was amazing to watch. The large central banks over in Europe just continued to sell gold. We used to have a joke. In fact, one of the guys actually on our old monitor that told us the gold price had a button that he had created that said press, you know, once gold hits $290 or what have you. And So just as soon as gold got close to $300, we'd press the button and it dropped down to 270 And it just did this for years. And a lot of that was central bank selling into the market. And Brown was renowned for that with the Bank of England. Not the only Gordon that comes from England. (laughs) Well, but there's a trend change in that, too. I think we have to look at the trend change in the fact that central banks are not net sellers right now. They are net buyers of gold, are they not? Well, they are. Estimated to grow to 800 to 1,000 tons by 2013, up from basically zero in 2007. And you were talking about a previous era where they were actually liquidators into the market. And Kevin, this is largely new currency reserves, which have amassed over the last 20 to 40 years by developing countries. And it's in sync with sort of this theme of the rise of the rest. As the G3 has become less relevant and you've expanded the audience to the G7, and the G7 has then become less relevant, and the G20 has become more relevant. You're seeing sort of democratization within the world where everybody wants a larger voice and is not willing to just follow the lead of what once was two great powers and is now one great power, the United States. Everyone feels that they should be represented and represented well, and they'll do that best representing themselves. Yeah, David, it's amazing to see some of these countries we didn't even think about 10 years ago exerting influence, but even beyond influence, they want actual say in worldwide monetary affairs. 
even see evidence for that in the last round of fundraising at the IMF. You know, they raised several hundred billion dollars. The U.S. did not contribute, but everyone who did contribute said, okay, now the IMF has a bigger war chest. We've given you the war chest, and we expect to have more of a voice. So there was sort of a gift with strings attached, but I think that's to be expected. Well, you know, David, the central banks had always been strong on buying of dollar reserves. Okay, that was actually sort of written into the contract of the Bretton Woods Agreement, which, by the way, we have slowly broken. But with that being said, do you think that this increase in gold reserves in the central banks is another way of moderating dollar exposure? Well, that's exactly what they're doing. Implicit to this is the challenge to the singular nature of the dollar reserve status. In large part, the purchasing of gold by these central banks is exactly what you described. It's a moderation of existing dollar exposure. You see it with Mexico. You see it with Russia. Just here in the last day, you had announced an additional billion-dollar purchase from both Mexico and Russia. You've got Thailand, Korea, Bolivia, Colombia, countries like this that have benefited from trade with the U.S. and Europe, and they want to solidify their capital base. These are the types of countries that are utilizing trade surplus dollars for gold acquisitions, which is very different than the old gold holders. Right. So looking at the gold reserves, I mean, the United States still leads the pack as far as gold reserves. At least that's what they say. Okay, 8,000 tons of gold. You've got people out there who say we don't even have that, but I'm not going to go down that road. What are the countries that play the largest role in gold reserves right now? Well, you have sort of two different worlds, Kevin. You've got the pre-Bretton Woods and the post-Bretton Woods. The pre-Bretton Woods are the old guys that still have the gold. The U.S. with over 8,000 tons. Germany with between 3,000 and 3,500 tons of gold. The IMF at close to 2,900 tons. Italy at about 24, 2,500 tons. France, I think, is right about the same. And then you've got the new crowd, sort of the post-Bretton Woods era. Those are the folks who've developed these capital bases, these asset reserve bases, as a result of selling stuff. Are you talking about China? Well, China, the Middle East, but Asia specifically, because they're the ones who've been manufacturing and selling into our voracious appetite to consume more and more stuff. China is choosing to acquire ounces in the open market. They're also buying miners instead, and that gives them the ability to build their reserves in terms of gold ounces at actually the cost of production as opposed to the market price. That saves them anywhere from six to $800 per ounce. It's a little bit fun. To me, that you never pay retail seems to be that sort of ironic principle in play from the country that has and continues to supply the retail gluttons all over the world, Walmart being their primary distribution depot. Well, I know that Walmart's sort of a sore subject right now, so we won't bring up Walmart. But as far as investment demand, we were talking central banking demand, and it is. It's actually more than subtle that China produces more gold than anybody in the world now over South Africa. They now import more gold than anybody in the world now, plus... They're buying mines. And so not only are they buying gold, but they're buying up that which produces it from the ground. So maybe they'll take their 1,100 tons or so and turn that into two, three, four thousand 4,000 tons pretty quick. Well, and it is unabated demand in Asia with a slowing trend in the U.S. And for us, this is not really a concern. U.S. physical demand, you know, if you want a relative comparison, is roughly two and a half times the size of Vietnam. Right. So we don't represent much. No, not when we're outpacing Vietnam, we're outpacing Turkey. We consume about (laughs) twice the gold that Turkey does. China and India account for 52% of physical gold demand. If you throw in the rest of the Pacific Rim region, you're closer to 60-65%. So the U.S. buys as much in physical metals as, say, the entire Middle East. Mm -hmm. Frankly, Kevin, given our economy, the size of our economy, which is significantly larger, that still surprises me. Nevertheless, U.S. demand, we think, will pick up over the next 12 to 24 months in sort of a final stage of the bull market in metals, maybe 36 to 48 months, but it will coincide with the reason for global panic into the metals. And it'll be U.S. consumers buying, perhaps for the first time, for the same reason an even larger audience globally is, a U.S. fiscal crisis coinciding with monetary policy excess. Well, you know, this makes me think we may have been asleep at the wheel, Dave. People who've talked about gold being an inflation hedge and keeping up just with inflation. And when gold goes up, it's mainly because of the printing of money and inflation. Maybe we've been asleep at the wheel. Maybe gold is rising. Once again, you're listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary at McIlvaney.com. M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. Your dad used to talk about the golden rule all the time. The golden rule is he who has the gold makes the rules. 
the gold is being shifted over to the east. The prices have been rising because of this incredible demand. How much does it really play into the true CPI numbers? Is it really being affected by inflation right now, or is it more the demand? Well, you know, you know that central banks still are controlling the most gold in the U.S. and the West. Right. But there is this gradual shift, and I think we can extrapolate and say that over the next several years, should this continue, the 1,200 tons per year that the Chinese will not only buy on the open market but produce themselves, that over several years, they will accumulate more than France. They will have more than Germany. They will be neck and neck with the U.S. in terms mm-hmm. of number two, in terms of total stock of metals. But on the point of inflation, David, our expectation, going back to that theme of the show, expectations, our expectation is that gold keeps up with inflation. Is it inflation that's influencing this 11-year bull market? I think, actually, gold does a very poor job of keeping up with inflation. It does an excellent job of catching up to Uh. inflation. So at some point you do see sort of the rubber band snap and the gold price does catch up to inflation. It does reflect inflation. So it returns to an equilibrium, but it doesn't necessarily keep up with it all the time. No, that's correct. And there is that misconception that gold has been moving up over the last 10 years in light of U.S. CPI expectations, the consumer price index, and the way we measure inflation here in the United States. And that that's why gold is moving higher. So if there's no inflation, then gold should go down. In fact, there's little evidence for this. Overwhelmingly, the price has been driven by an increase in nominal income growth in China and the Indian subcontinent. That has been the primary driver over the last 20 years, and particularly the last 10 years. That's right, more money flowing to the general populations in countries where gold has been bought for cultural reasons for centuries. They have more money to spend, and what do they like to spend money on? What have they liked to spend money on for decades, if not centuries? And that goes into sort of the social structure of the societies today. What about slowing growth in China? Sure. That could be an issue. Well, that's what I'm wondering. Does it argue for a decline in prices if they're starting to shrink? And now when I say shrink, it's a little bit like saying they're not growing as quickly because their growth is still outpacing the United States growth by at least 7%. And I would argue that quite to the contrary, slowing growth in China comes part and parcel with the rebalancing of China. As they're attempting to take away from export dependence, the economy based on that, and also move away from government-directed investment investment schemes, what they're having to do is create the backdrop for a consumer-oriented economy. You're seeing that in rising wages. You're seeing that in the sacking of Bose Lai and the host of other indicators that show that the Politburo is very intent. Their recent five-year plan stated it explicitly, and they're following through in terms of actions that say, we are going to make the transition to being less export-dependent and being more autonomous. You're seeing that as they talk about their currency and seeing it move towards a free-floating economy. They're expanding the bank even further. Kevin, this is the point. Households will be positively impacted by this increase in income right. as the government attempts to wean itself from that old mercantilist model of growth and push towards a consumption model of growth. I'm not saying that that's the ideal model, that everyone should just buy more stuff, but that is a way that they can wean themselves away from being U.S. and European dependents. Well, and you know, Stephen Roach has pointed out in the past when we've interviewed him, that there is no social net that will catch the retired you know, we have Social Security, we have various entitlement programs, and that's a different show altogether. But the Chinese really have nothing there, so they have to save. Yeah, and I would suggest that if you're looking for something that is gold negative in the China story, it's simply this, and it's a very, very future tense issue. As and when the Politburo begins to effectively implement a social safety net, and people begin to have confidence in that social safety net, which takes some time for people to adopt a different pattern of behavior when it comes comes to investing and saving. We're talking about Social Security, the equivalent of Medicare, Medicaid, where people know that their retirement needs are going to be met. They know that their health care needs are going to be met. Why is this important? Because today China has a huge savings rate. And it's not just because they're generally thrifty. It's because they have nothing to count on in right. the future. They have to depend on themselves. Therefore, they save 50% or more of their income. They don't have that social safety net. What government will try to do is ultimately unlock that vast Chinese block of savings by offering some sort of a social plan. Here's what we bring to the table. Here's how we're going to take care of you in old age. You didn't have enough children, but that's okay. We will take care of you. The state will be your nanny.
Well, in fact, David, if I'm thinking right here, China actually invented fiat currency. When we're talking about saving, the question could come up, why wouldn't you save in dollars right now? Why wouldn't you save in euros or even renminbi? But they have seen the abuse of fiat currency all through history, and they're buying gold. And they were even encouraged by the state to buy gold. But now I'm going to shift gears here because we've talked about demand. Asian demand right now is intact and continuing. But Supply also. Anybody who takes economics knows that there's not only demand factors, but there's supply factors. Gold right now is much easier from a monetary standpoint to mine than it was 10 years ago when it was three or four hundred bucks an ounce. Now it's 16 to 17 hundred dollars an ounce. The profits have to be enough to where they're increasing supply on these mining ventures. Where does the supply picture come out in this? Well, let's say yes and no to that comment you just made because along with the quintupling in the price of gold and silver has been a tripling, quadrupling, almost quintupling of the price of oil, if you're talking about the peak in the price of oil. So the cost of mining has gone up as well, maybe not as quickly. Right, and that squeezes profits for your miners. But peak production is thought to be reached in the mining space by about 2014 hmm. at roughly 31 to 3,200 tons. And we would estimate that the peak in prices, so not the peak in production, but the peak in prices would follow the 2014 date, probably 2015 to 2017 as a time frame. Of course, events could bring that time frame forward closer to sort of the 2014-2016 time frame if the market should become event-driven. But you don't have those extra huge mine sources coming onto the market. You don't have mine hedging books that are being eliminated. In fact, there's only about 200 tons that remain, so that's not going to be a major contributor to supply. So in other words, gold mines are not like Doritos, munch all you want and we'll make more. There is a limit to that, and you're saying 2014 is probably the limit as far as peak production? Yeah, and this is the best that you've got because you've had a huge amount of capital expenditure going into exploration and mine development, and the best you're going to get is about a 15 to 20 percent increase in mine production and just for a short little period of time. Now, that's been growing here in the last year or two, and again, it'll peak by about 2014. Well, and I'll just add this, David. Gold as a percentage of global assets has shrunk because global assets have risen compared to, let's just go back to the last bull market in gold going back to the 1980s. Yeah, and exclude real estate. If you're just talking about stocks and bonds, gold represents roughly 5% of total world wealth. Today. So a nickel on every dollar basically is gold. There's still 95 cents out there that needs to run to something if something gets tense. Well, and if you look at the peak in the 80s, it was a quite a bit higher number where it was closer to 14% of global assets. More aggressive estimates at gold's peak of 875 put it at closer to 20% of global assets, and, and I, th I think that may be stretching it a bit, but 14%, roughly three times relative to stocks and bonds, is, is an interesting story to follow. Well, and you know, when we talk about mines hitting peak production by 2014, I have to go back to the 1980s and say, you know, it was awfully good to be a gold mining stock towards the end of that cycle. It wasn't necessarily good to be a gold shareholder through most of the 1970s, but as that 1979 to 80 peak came in gold, you certainly did want to own the mines. Now, the mines right Right now, don't seem to be doing very well, at least in the stock market. Well, you've heard of the 80-20 rule, Kevin. That you, when you're talking about gold versus gold mines, it's more like the 90-10 rule. 90% uh, of the time, you want to own physical metals, and you probably want to own them all the time. But about 10% of the time, a very small sliver, time slice, if you will, you might be paid handsomely to own the shares. But again, it's the 90-10 rule. You're going to be served the majority of the time best by physical metals. You've had gold stocks which have underperformed the metal since 2006. Today, they're trading at about 30-year lows relative to the metal, and many of them are now in the single-digit P.E. range, and I think they're likely to trade back to sort of the 30 and 40 price-to-earnings range over the next several years, driven higher by the price of the metal itself. Well, David, gold stocks, and we've always warned our clients of this, gold stocks are always more risky than owning the physical metal. You may sometimes have the higher payout, but, you know, there are things that can happen, <laughs> and I've got scars on my investment portfolio to say that sometimes a mine will flood, and sometimes a leader will just go ahead and national. I mean, we're seeing this now in Argentina. We've seen it in Venezuela. So nationalization is also a vulnerability, isn't it? You have not only the extreme of nationalization, but you've got an increase of royalties and taxes, 
yes, you could even have a confiscation of lease rights in various jurisdictions around the world. Those kinds of risks abound. And I think you have a conservative set of investors saying, well, we kind of like gold shares as a perpetual call, the non-expiring call on the gold price. But with that, you take on a lot of volatility. As evidenced by this last year, we had a little run up of 11% in gold, and gold shares managed to lose 20% at the same time. Not very impressive. Not really, but I don't think that's likely to continue. I, I think you will see sort of in this next couple of years an interesting little stretch for the miners. You know, another thing about gold stocks, Dave, and again, we're not discouraging the ownership of gold stocks, but you have to keep it in perspective because there's this concept of portable property or portable wealth. You know, I remember years ago, probably 25 years ago, I heard your dad speak and he was talking about real estate and he said, real estate is a wonderful investment. God made a certain amount of ground. If you buy that ground, nobody's going to make more of it. But the problem is you can't put it in your pocket. You can't go somewhere else with it. And so he always said, it's good to balance your real estate with portable real estate that which you can put in your pocket. And that's what real gold does. Well, and Kevin, looking at Great Expectations, again, Dickens' famous work, there is this concept of portable property, this much anticipated coming of age and the receipt of inheritance. And right. the interesting part is that the term used to describe it was not, as you may be familiar with, patrimony or inheritance or birthright. But it was portable property because there was a contrast to be made. When you came of age, there was almost like a trust fund, if you will, in modern language that you got when you were 18 or 21 or whatever. Right. But there was also an inheritance that you might have later in life that was not portable property. These might be estates. These might be interests you know. in mines. You know, right. Again, going back to the theme of you can own the mine, but you can't really take that with you anywhere. Right. And this notion of portable property, it's what's given to you, literally dropped at your feet when you're 18 or 21. And that, in the Dickens novel, is what he's given. What I like about the language is that it communicates very clearly at least one of the benefits of owning that kind of property, whatever it is. Right. What is your portable property? Is it gemstones? Is it gold? Is it cash? Is it stock certificates as opposed to, again, something that you don't have in your physical possession? What percentage of your wealth is represented by some form of portable property. Now, this is not something that we generally think is important in the United States, because why would you need your property to be portable? And this is where I think, again, in terms of expectations, we deal with sort of a misconception driven by our history. We've lived in a very safe continent, surrounded on either side, the Atlantic and the Pacific. We've never seen sort of the destruction of other real estates. And that idea of having some part of your wealth that is portable, it just doesn't even really connect, I think, with Americans as much as it does with everyone else in the world. Well, you know, it's fascinating, David, and sometimes you have to travel and talk to people to understand just how good we've had it here in America. Now, good or bad, we have really gotten soft. You know, I was reading this morning before I came into work, just a navigator's tale of the bombing of Cologne. You know, this was a guy who was a navigator and a bomber in World War II, and I thought about it. They had hit Bremen the week before. They had bombed Cologne. I know you were in Cologne just a few weeks ago. These people's towns were completely leveled. Now, the United States has never experienced anything like that. But Europe, this is just a continued operation in Europe. Or how about the Middle East? Uh, the same thing. Or how about anyone who settled here in the United States from Vietnam? Right. What did they leave with? You know, you're talking about gold or some sort of portable property. 1979, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan, you had 747s lined up on runways, and they were loading them with portable property. And I can tell you that was not Humvees and, you know, frivolous things like that. It was gold bars yeah. headed for a safe jurisdiction, namely Switzerland, or wherever they were most contented holding their gold bars. But the only thing that they could take with them, leaving their primary asset behind, the gold that was in the ground, specifically black gold, <laughs> yeah. they had to take with them what they could, their portable property. Well, David, as an American, sometimes I realize that I've really lived in an amazingly comfortable environment, a little bit like a farm-fed fish, you know. When you taste a trout or a salmon that's been raised in a lake, it's been fed a certain amount of food, they don't taste the same as the ones who've had to move, who've had to live, who, like we've talked about before, they had to expend calories to actually survive. Right. Well, you're talking about farm-raised fish that know where their next meal is coming from. Sure. It's the guy who walks up to them, and that natural threat of, I should flee, I'm prey, he's predator, all of a sudden is gradually over time reversed, and there's a dependent relationship developed, so you know where your next meal comes from, you're unconcerned by predators, you work very little to survive or thrive, and Kevin, farm-raised 
these fish, the big question is how would these fish adapt to being in the wild? Right. This is the theme where, you know, again, we mentioned the movie, salmon fishing in Yemen. Right. Okay, so the challenge was how do you take 10,000 salmon that have been farm-raised and put them into a stream? They, for several generations, have never had to swim upstream. And so do they have an instinct? Will they survive in nature having been so coddled and taken care of? Or do they just wait for food and then die? Yeah. Right. Kevin, this idea of farm-raised fish being able to adapt, it made me wonder watching the movie, if we don't have a generation of investors somewhat like this, will they be able to adapt? We have a generation accustomed to stocks going up. As if the natural current of the market was in one direction only, without the slightest bend in course or rise or fall over the rocks being an opportunity. All they've done is swim in circles and been basically fed. Well, and not to mention interest rates during the last 30 years. I mean, our adult lives have been with a declining interest rate market. Now, well, how hard is it when you can borrow more money at less and less interest? And on top of that, they're now being pressed even lower by artificial means, which to farm-raised fish may seem normal. And you know, So these are the elements that, like nature, have been removed from a controlled environment. The market is too unruly on its own. The prices are too erratic to move without the external, the sort of superior guidance of the fish farmer. We have the Fed as fish farmer, if you will, making sure that the environment is ripe for us to grow and be healthy. Now, I guess the analogy ends because we don't all end up in cellophane and on ice. But you know, the question is more about adaptation. And do we, under a different set of circumstances, having been conditioned for generations to believe that the market operates just so, so will we adapt to a different set of rules as and when those rules emerge? Well, and those rules are emerging, David, because for the last 70 years, we've had a reserve currency. I mean, not only did the Fed feed us this currency, but it was the world's reserve currency. So every time our nation actually went into debt, they were borrowing their own money. <laughs> well, so between easy money and cheaper all the time, a market that allows you to just float about with volatility smoothed by the management of the Fed, you begin to wonder if this generation of fish can survive off the farm. I tend to believe that they can, but there is a question of building strength and coming to a point of stream savviness, if you will, and that's going to take a bit of time. It's also going to take a recalibration, an adjustment to a new and different environment, and actually a lot of stress and strain in the process. Survive we will, thrive I think we can, and the question is, do you have the gumption to transition? Well, and I think people who are listening to the show, David, are probably getting a good start because people who are continually questioning the norm and saying, all right, what am I missing? Where am I too comfortable? Where do I need to train or change what I'm doing? You know, it's what you've talked about before is rehearsing for something different. And that rehearsal has to be done now, not during the time. Well, again, so it's odd for us in the U.S. to think of portable property, going back to that Dickensian phrase. It's odd for us to think about even the need for it because we've had stability, market stability currency stability, political stability, social stability, all of these things we now take for granted. And the concept of portable property makes no sense to someone who lives in the United States. Right. Although anyone else, anywhere else in the world, it's axiomatic. You don't have all your eggs in one geographic basket. That, I would suggest, is how we're going to have to begin to think differently and perhaps get off the farm. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. Now, I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.